So I'm a cardiologist and I joined AstraZeneca a year ago and I'm currently the clinical vice president for late stage CVRM, which basically means running the large scale outcome studies that lead to licensing of new drugs. And that's for cardiovascular, including heart failure. I'm a cardiologist and for, prior to joining AstraZeneca, I led the heart failure unit at the Brompton Hospital in London for 22 years. And I was a professor in Imperial College in London also. I've also been on the board of NICE, which is the English uh, Reimbursement Authority for four years as well. So quite a broad experience in cardiovascular disease and trying to bring innovation to people living with cardiovascular problems. Uh, but as I said, with AstraZeneca for the past 12 months. I think for me and for most physicians attending that uh, meeting that was presented recently, it's about making it very clear what good treatment looks like for patients and what doctors should be doing in their day-to-day -day practice. And I think it was two key things for me. One was that you have to look at the person in front of you. It's not a question of this first line, second line, third line, fourth line drugs, and you just work through it like a recipe. It's a question of phenotyping the patient better, looking at their comorbidities, what their heart failure is like, what the heart rate's like, what their atrial fibrillation, what their kidney function is like, whether they've got diabetes or not, and then saying, okay, which of these drugs are going to be most beneficial and which ones can I introduce first off? And the general thing is to try and get as many any of these life-changing drugs into the patient as quickly as possible, but, but doing it sensibly so you're using the right combination of drugs that are likely to give problems initially, and then as the patient gets more stable, you can layer in the other. So I think for me, it's a much more nuanced and intelligent and personalized approach to the guideline, which uh, is nice to see. The second thing, which I think was a major thing, was to see that the SGLT2 inhibitors, including Forsega, were upgraded to 1A recommendation, which is the highest recommendation, as you know, which means that the evidence is very secure, there's more than one randomized trial, and this should be done unless there's some very good reason not to. And you might say, well, going up from a 1B to a 1A, who cares? But actually, for many physicians, they look at the 1A and say, okay, that is not negotiable. That is what I should be doing. And it's actually very influential across many countries. And of course, the North American guidelines, US guidelines, et cetera, had also upgraded SGLT2 a bit earlier. So it's good to see that. And the question then for most physicians is, well, why did they upgrade it? And actually, most physicians said it was about time it was upgraded because the evidence is so secure now. We've got so many studies with literally tens of thousands of patients in total now that show the benefit of SGLT2 inhibition for SIGA, for example, for not just people with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, but also patients with heart failure of any flavor, whether it's low ejection fraction, middle ejection fraction, preserved ejection fraction, who cares? It's across the spectrum of heart failure, SGLT2 and inhibition is really should be foundational. And then also, of course, for patients with chronic kidney disease. So that for me was a big news piece. And it was nice to see the guidelines getting up to date with the evidence. And that will be very influential in practice, maybe not for super specialists who are already doing that for years and believe that to be the case. But for those that are less specialist or need more confidence, having that in the guideline as a 1A was really important. These were the two pivotal trials of SGLT2 inhibition. The first one, DAPA HF, took a very kind of standard approach to this, which patients with low ejection fraction heart failure. And it was the first big trial in heart failure to do this. And it clearly demonstrated that patients did much better both in terms of cardiovascular mortality and the risk of hospitalization. So that was for low ejection fraction heart failure, DAPA HF. I don't think so many people were surprised there. They were very pleased to see the results, very impactful, very important. And of course, it's a drug that's been around for a while, so people are familiar with it. So that was super good. However, the liver, it was much more of a challenge because a lot of people thought, well, heart failure, preserved ejection fractions, really different type of patients, a different type of heart failure. No drug so far has been demonstrated to be clearly better than placebo here. Some hints from some, but nothing definite. So the guidelines, therapy a few years ago for HFPEF was 
virtually nothing. So Deliver was set up, very large trial, and comparing DAPA versus placebo in exactly this patient group. And uh, I think it was around 6,300 patients or so, but I can, uh, you can look up the detail specifically, but very convincing evidence at the end of the day that patients did much better with this. And the evidence was definitely for heart failure hospitalization, but also strongly towards cardiovascular mortality benefit. And Scott Solomon and John McMurray, who kind of were the leaders of both trials, did a very nice analysis where they said, okay, let's just look at the benefit of DAPA across the whole range of ejection fraction from DAPA HF with low ejection fractions through into deliver with middle range and then high, higher levels. And they found the benefit was virtually the same all the way across ejection fraction. And that's why increasingly people say, if you've got heart failure, you need Forsega because heart failure syndrome you will do better with Forsega. So it was building the evidence, DAPA HF, then deliver HF, putting them together, getting the guidelines, regulators, all of those things on the same page. So a very interesting journey in the last few years and really nice to see the guidelines catching up with that, both US and European.